Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Claire. Um, Claire is the director of our Parks Institute uh, here in Southampton. And um, I think we've assembled a, a wonderful lot of speakers this year. And um, my name is Mark Cornwall. I'm a professor of modern European history here at Southampton. I'm delighted to chair this um, uh, uh, seminar today and to welcome Marsha Rosenblit as our speaker. Um, Marsha is Harvey M. Mayerhoff, Professor of Modern Jewish Studies at the University of Maryland. And I have to say that I last met Marsha in 2018 at a workshop in New York before COVID and um, really um, pressed her to come and speak to us in Southampton. So this is the result of, of that uh, uh, invitation some time ago. Um, she's a distinguished historian of Jewish life and identity in the late Habsburg Empire, one of the foremost historians on this subject. She's um, got a, a huge um, range of publications over the last 40 years. Um, I would mention um, her two major books. One is The Jews of Vienna, Assimilation and Identity. Um, I should say I'm using this in a few weeks on our Jewish Studies MA here at Southampton. Um, in this book, she explores complex Jewish lives in a city which offered positive and negative experiences. If you think of the, um, uh, the nostalgic view of Stefan Zweig, but then you put that against the what we know about the growth of anti-Semitism in the city of Vienna. Um, her second book was Restru uh, Reconstructing a National Identity, the Jews of Habsburg, Austria during World War I. And here she reveals very subtly, I think, the Jewish wartime experience, how it was viewed by some in um, through a kind of loyal, a lens of loyalty and others through a lens of disloyalty. She contributed a chapter also on Habsburg patriotism of the Jews to um, volume 11 of the Habsburger monarchy, which um, some of you may know is this encyclopedic study of the Habsburg empire, um, which has been going on for about 50 years, produced by the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Um, she's written almost 40 scholarly articles on many themes of Jewish social history and um, has also edited uh, two books, um, Constructing Nationalities in East Central Europe, and then more recently um, uh, um, edited a book about World War I and the Jews. Um, she's been president of the Association for Jewish Studies um, and is a fellow of the American Academy for Jewish Research. So we're really I'm delighted to have um, Marsha kind of, I didn't have to twist her arm to get her here. We're, we're <laughs> delighted to have her here. Um, she's currently working on a project on Jewish life in Moravia, of course now part of the Czech Republic. And that is the theme for her talk tonight. Um, it's about, um, the paper's gonna be called, is called Jews as Germans, the dilemmas of the Jews of Moravia, 1848 to 1938. Um, I should just say before we begin, um, please do put any questions you have in the chat. Um, we can <clears throat> have questions coming in during the <clears throat> during uh, Marsha's talk, um, and obviously an opportunity for questions afterwards in the chat, or if you raise your hand afterwards, um, you can speak in person. Um, so um, over to you, Marsha. Delighted to have you here. Thank you so much, Mark, for that wonderful introduction. I'm, I'm, you know, I almost blushed during it because it was so, so very warm and and lovely. And thank you all to the Parks Institute and the University of Southampton for hosting me this for me afternoon. I guess it's evening for you already. Um, but uh, it's wonderful to be able, through the virtues of technology, to to have an international audience, and and that's actually quite lovely. So, okay, today I'm going to talk about the Jews of Moravia. I think Moravia is a really interesting place uh, to study the relationship of the Jews of Europe to German language, culture, and identification. True, there were not very many Jews in Moravia. Um, at its height, maybe 44,000 um, uh, in the late 19th century, 44,000 out of about 2 million, um, so about 2% of the population. It was really a very small group. But this was a group of Jews who adopted the German language and German culture beginning in the late 18th century, in the late 1700s. Before that, they'd spoken Yiddish, like all the Jews of Europe. Um, but by the middle of the 19th century, they spoke German. They were a German-speaking group. And they joined, these Jews joined the community of other German speakers in the province. 
But this province of the Habsburg monarchy, or this province of Habsburg uh, Austria, um, consisted approximately of two thirds Czech speakers and only one third German speakers. So it was a mixed language province. Um, and in the late 19th century, there was a conflict between the nationalist activists, that is those people who were concerned with creating a national identity, of the nationalist identity uh, activists over German rights and Czech rights within, within Austria. And the Czech nationalists, the Czech nationalist activists, did not like that the Jews spoke German and felt part of the German community. Um, and they, this led to pressure on the Jews to become Czech and also non-acceptance of them if they did, right? Because, you know, Jews, they changed their identity like they changed their pants. But um, so, it, you know, there, it was a complicated pressure. Um, there was, of course, also Czech anti-Semitism. Um, and sometimes uh, anti-German um, and anti-Jewish animosities spilled over into violence against all German speakers and Jews among them especially. Um, so especially at moments of stress um, during elections and other times like that at the end of World War I, um, there were moments of stress in which there was, there was also violence. And there was of course also German anti-Semitism. I mean, it was a very complicated situation. But what did this being German mean to the Jews? That's what I want to explore this afternoon. What did being German mean to the Jews? To what extent did they think they were Germans? Um, to what extent did they feel that they were part of the community of Germans, um, uh, uh, of other German speakers in Moravia? And how did the creation of Czechoslovakia uh, after World War I in late 1918, had that, how did that change the dynamics of Jewish loyalties? So my argument today, I'm gonna to summarize my argument before I even uh, start talking. My argument today is that the Jews certainly adopted German language culture and culture, um, and they felt part of the community of Germans, um, the, especially its political uh, branch, you know, the sort of the political community of Germans when the Germans were still mostly liberal, when they became less liberal, not so much, um, but they were part of the community of Germans in Habsburg, Moravia, but not in Czechoslovakia. Uh, the Jews though, no matter in either period, did not think that they were German in some essentialist or felkish, using the German term felkish or biological or racial sense. They felt that their prim primary identification was as Jews uh, and that they were German Jews. That is, they were a third group in the province, their own group, which functioned in German and was allied with the Germans, but not actually part of the Germans. Indeed, many German speaking Jews in Moravia came to think that German was a Jewish language. I mean, they knew it wasn't, but they, but they came to feel it was a Jewish language, a, a language that Jews spoke with other Jews and with, in which they conducted Jewish family life and Jewish community life. Uh, this was most evident actually in Czechoslovakia in the interwar period, when the majority of Jews um, identified um, or registered as members of the Jewish nation on the census. And I'll explain what that means later. But the, um, they identified as members of the Jewish nation on the census and even voted for a Jewish party um, uh, for parliamentary elections. And then in 1935, approximately, well, not approximately, in 1935, when most people who identified as Germans voted for the Sudeten Deutsche Partei, the Sudeten German Party, uh, about which uh, Mark has written so eloquently, uh, when the majority of people uh, who were ident self identified as Germans voted for that party, more than the majority, two thirds, um, and we had some attraction to Nazi Germany, some, not as much as we used to think, but, uh, but nevertheless some, um, the Jews of Moravia totally abandoned their German identification um, and finally cast their lots with the Czechs. Although they still continued to speak German with each other. German then really was truly just a Jewish language for inter intra group communication. So the experience of Jews in Moravia tells us a lot about, I think, about the meaning of ethnic and national identity in a very complex 
landscape. Okay, so that's, that's basically what I'm gonna argue. And I'd like to be, begin by just sharing a map with you briefly. Um, so I'm gonna share my map and uh, let's go down to here and move down. Okay, this is just a map of the Habsburg Empire or Austria-Hungary in 1900. Um, and you can see where Moravia is, it's right here. Um, today, the two provinces of Bohemia and Moravia are the Czech and part of Silesia, this is Silesia, are the Czech Republic. And in the interwar period, Bohemia, Moravia, oops, I went too far. Uh, Bohemia, ah, sorry. Um, Bohemia, Moravia, Silesia, and this area of northern, what had been northern Hungary, which came to be called Slovakia, that became Czechoslovakia, right? So th that, this is our landscape. There's Habsburg, Moravia, and then this just gives you a picture of Jewish communities. We'll look at that later. This is just a map of interwar Czechoslovakia and interwar Europe in general. So here's Czechoslovakia next to Germany, Austria, Hungary, Poland, et cetera. All right, so um, I am going to keep this map up for a little while. I may go out of it for some time, but for the, in the meantime, I'll keep at it. So Jews in Habsburg, Moravia belonged to and felt comfortable in the German world. Although most of them were bilingual, most of them spoke Czech as well. Um, most of them were bilingual. Their primary language was German. German was the language of their education, they, the language they used to speak to each other, the language they used to conduct, you know, I'm gonna get out of this, we don't really need to look at this. The language they, um, uh, they spoke to each other, the language they used to conduct Jewish religious, communal and organizational life. German to them was also a symbol of their modernization, uh, of their deep and abiding loyalty to the Habsburg monarchy, and of their political allegiance to liberalism. German had become, as I've said, a Jewish language, a, a language Jews used whether they lived among other German speakers in the largely German speaking north of the province or, or extreme south of the province, um, or if they lived among Czech speakers in the market towns of central and southern Bohemia, where most of them in fact lived. Um, in the latter, that is in the Czech speaking, actually, I, you know, I'm gonna keep the screen up so you can see the map. So let's let's go back and let's, um, this is a map of Moravia and you will be seeing in it the, um, oh, sorry, uh, where Jews lived. But when I, the Northern part of the province sort of up here was pretty much entirely German speaking and the extreme South down here was also pretty much German speaking. The rest of it was Czech speaking and the Jews most, lived in that region, in the Czech-speaking region, but they spoke German. Um, uh, in the latter, that is in these market towns where, where most people were Czech speakers, Jews were sometimes the only local German speakers, so that the German language and Jews became synonymous terms locally, both in their own eyes and in the eyes of their Czech-speaking neighbors. Regarding German as somehow Jewish also provided Jews with a rationale to maintain their German allegiance when in the late 19th century, rising Czech nationalism made it more problematic to do so. In Moravia, Jews not only spoke German and attended German schools, they also joined German organizations, supported German causes, and voted for the German Liberal Party and its progressive offshoots. The German speaking world of Moravia generally welcomed the Jews, especially in Southern and Central Moravia, where German speaking cities, there were some, there were a group of German speaking cities like, here it is, Brun, Brno, and, um, and some others that we'll talk about later, um, where German speaking cities, commonly called Sprachinsel, that is speech islands, uh, existed in a largely Czech speaking region, and much less so, that is, the Germans were less welcoming in northern Moravia, where, with its dense concentration of German speakers, and greater receptivity to radical German nationalism. Most Moravian Jews, however, lived in the south and central portion of the province, not in the north. So they felt welcome in the German world in the province. Comfortable in this German world, Moravian Jews also always formed a subgroup within it. They were German Jews, always aware that they formed a somewhat separate group within the larger community of Germans. 
that sense of separateness was generated not only by the fact that they practiced or didn't practice another religion, a different religion than their Catholic neighbors. Most Jews assumed that they formed a Jewish ethnic group, not all Jews, but most Jews, uh, a Jewish ethnic group with its own history, cultural concerns, and social practices. For historical reasons, the Jewish group was intimately intertwined with the German world. But such intertwining always came with a consciousness of difference. Jews regarded themselves as German by language, education, culture, and political preference, but they always remained aware of Jewish difference and specifically Jewish concerns. The Jewish connection to the German language in Habsburg, Moravia dates to the late 18th century and the efforts of Emperor Joseph II to Germanize his realm and modernize and Germanize his Jews in order to make them more useful to the state. Before the 1780s, Jews in Moravia, like, like all Jews all over Central Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, spoke Yiddish, a language which derived from medieval High German. In the, the, um, okay, so it derives from that. Okay, the early 18th century before Joseph was a period of increasing restrictions for Moravian and Bohemian Jews. In 1726-27, Habsburg authorities sought to limit Jewish population growth by enacting the Familians Law, the Familiantengesetz in German, which limited the number of Jewish families in the Bohemian lands. This was also true in Bohemia, and allowed only firstborn sons or another son if the first one had died to marry. In Moravia, authorities restricted the number of Jewish families in the whole province to 5,106 that's families, increased in 1787 to 5,400, and allocated to each community a certain number of familiantin numbers, each awarded to a head of household, which could only be transferred upon the death of the familiant himself. Although many Jews evaded the law with secret marriages, in fact, the law succeeded in restricting and preventing population expansion, as many younger sons migrated to nearby Western Hungary where marriage restrictions did not exist. At the same time, the Habsburgs also restricted Jews to closed Jewish quarters in the towns in which they lived. People commonly refer to these as ghettos. Um, in 1745, the Empress tried to expel the Jews altogether uh, of both Bohemia and Moravia, but she didn't. She was persuaded not to do so, um, although they had to pay a very heavy toleration um, tax. All of these residential and marriage restrictions as well as the toleration and other onerous taxes lasted until their abrogation during the revolution of 1848. The situation of the Jews in the Bohemian lands improved substantially during the reign of Maria Theresa's son, Joseph II, who reigned from 1780 to 1790. Joseph sought to centralize his realm and create a uniform legal system and an efficient bureaucracy loyal to him. He wanted this state and its government centralized government to function in the German language as a matter of efficiency, not German nationalism. Joseph also wanted to make the Jews useful to the state and integrated into its legal system. Accordingly, beginning in 1781, he issued a series of edicts of toleration for the Jews of the Habsburg Empire, which ended many of the economic, many but not all of the economic restrictions and some of the onerous taxes and encouraged them to enter all areas of commerce and craft production. More importantly, the Edicts of Toleration, including the 1782 Edict for Moravia, called for the Jews to acquire the German language, to use German and not Hebrew or Yiddish in their commercial contracts and records, and most significantly, to establish German Jewish schools to provide a secular education in the German, German language to their children, boys and girls, and or send them to Christian schools. Joseph's educational policy succeeded in making the Jews of Bohemia and Moravia into German speakers. Unlike in Galicia and Hungary, where Jews successfully relied on aristocratic opposition to Joseph's centralization policies to resist modern schools, in Bohemia and Moravia, Habsburg authorities co-opted local rabbis and Jewish communities into supporting the German Jewish schools. As a result, Jewish children attended German language Jewish, Jewish elementary schools in these provinces, and by the middle of the 19th century, the Jews in Bohemia and Moravia spoke German as their primary language. Joseph's successors continued to urge the Germanization of the Jews, but they also maintained many restrictions on Jewish life in the Bohemian lands. 
1798, for example, uh, Franz I ruled that Jews in Moravia could only live in special residential quarters in 52 towns in the province. They, they could not live, still could not live in the, in the royal cities of Brunn, Brno, Olmutz, Olomots, Iglau, Ilava, every, every place has both a German and a Czech name, Znai and Znoimo, and uh, Ungarisch, Chadish, Chadishte, Uherske. Pardon me, I don't speak either. I speak German, but not Czech or Hungarian, so I sometimes mistake the pronunciation. Thus, in the early 19th century, Moravian Jews lived in closed Jewish residential quarters, commonly called ghettos, in the market towns all over southern and central Moravia. And that's what this map is. The, the triangles that you see are these market towns that had closed Jewish residential quarters. There were 52 such towns. Um, with the largest in Nicholsburg, which is down here, Nicholsburg Mikulov down here, um, Prosnitz Prostyayev, which is here, and uh, uh, Baskowitz, Baskowitz, Boskovica, which is somewhere here. I can't, my eyes, oh, here it is, um, right over there. And uh, Holoshow, Holoshov, which is down here someplace. I, I, I had cataract surgery the other day, so my eyes aren't quite up to snuff. Although early 19th century population counts are not particularly reliable, probably about 30,000 Jews lived in the province in the first half, in the early 19th century. A vibrant traditional Jewish religious culture flourished, but it did not oppose the acquisition of German language. Okay. The revolution of 1848, largely concerned with creating a liberal constitution and ending feudal obligations led to the emancipation of the Jews, but only temporarily. Um, the Jews were, you know, given political rights and then most of them were rescinded uh, as, as the revolutionary rights were rolled back. So Jewish emancipation was rescinded by 1851, but the marriage restrictions and the residential restrictions never were reimposed. So the marriage restrictions ended in, in 1848 and the residential restrictions ended in 1848. Jews may have not enjoyed legal equality in the 1850s and 60s, but they could now leave the old ghettos and settle anywhere in the larger towns in which the ghettos had been located, in the Moravian cities formerly close to the Jews, or even in Vienna itself. Vienna is very close, by the way. You know, in, I mean, now the trains aren't so good, but Vienna is like here. You know, <laughs> it's uh, no, maybe here, but whatever. It's a, it's it's very close. Um, and of course, after the train was developed the railroad was developed, that was no problem. Although general restrictions on population movement in Austria did not end until 1859, 1860, already in the 1850s, Jews created new Jewish communities in the cities and larger Jewish communities in the and, and in the economically dynamic towns of the province. From the Jewish point of view, the 1850s and especially the 1860s were a time of rising opportunity. In 1867, the Jews finally received full emancipation as part of the liberal Austrian constitution of that year. At that time, there were just over 40,000 Jews in Moravia, and they enjoyed full civil, political, and economic rights as Austrian citizens. From this point on, Jews in Habsburg, Moravia, and also in nearby Bohemia, modernized fully a process which led to decreasing religious traditionalism and greater integration in the German cultural and political community. Okay, so now let's turn to the German language and what it all meant to them. Writing his memoirs in 1911 in order to tell his grandchildren about his life growing up in the 1830s and 40s in Prerau or Pshayrov, which is here, um, uh, Ignaz Bries, then a prominent malt factory owner in Olmutz, Olomots, fondly remembered how Jews in his childhood hometown combined Jewish religious traditionalism and German language and culture. Indeed, he proudly associated the German language with the modernization his family experienced. Greece's maternal grandfather was an autodidact, he taught himself, who possessed, and I quote, outstanding Jewish and German knowledge, unquote. Greece's father had studied in the famous yeshiva of the Chatam Sofer in Pressburg, Pozhony, Hungary, today Bratislava in Slovakia, where studying German was taboo, um, but he too had acquired secular German knowledge. A grain dealer and administrator of a noble estate, 
he read Schiller, Goethe, Kant, Leibniz, Spinoza, Maimonides, and Mendelssohn in his spare time. Reese's mother, a virtuous housewife, an eshet chayel, a woman of valor, and a leather dealer in her own right, uh, was also, quote, an ardent reader of modern belletristic writers, unquote. Naturally, Reese attended the local German Jewish school um, two to three hours every day, which in his day only taught secular subjects. That was the compromise. If they, these Jewish schools only taught the secular subjects and, and Jewish uh, boys went to the traditional Jewish school. Later, these Jewish schools did teach uh, Jewish subjects, but not in his day. Um, it, so he went to the traditional um, Jewish school, the Cheder, seven hours a day. Um, he also had a private tutor for Tom. Brees lovingly described the religious life of his community. At his bar mitzvah in 1846, he delivered a traditional Jewish learned talk, a drasha, he calls it, uh, during the service, which he prepared with the help of the local rabbi. But he also gave what he called a German sermon on, uh, for which his teacher at the German Jewish school provided assistance um, at an afternoon event with modern guests. On the other hand, so that was Greece, right? He lived in, in Olmutz, Olmutz, and he remembers this very lovely combination of, of German and Jewish religious traditionalism. On the other hand, Hugo Hermann, who grew up in a no longer religious home in the 1890s, in Maros Trubau or Moravska Chebova, which is in the north. He's unusual that he comes from the north. I can't find it, but it's someplace up here. Um, in Northern Moravia, recalled in his 1938 memoirs that his great grandparents still used Yiddish or Yiddish, he called, or sometimes he said Yiddish Deutsch, German Jewish, it's the same thing. But his grandparents, who came to Moravia from Bohemia in 1862 and leased a noble estate and the right to distill and sell alcohol, spoke and wrote proper German. Indeed, his grandfather, who had attended a German Jewish school and four years of a German gymnasium, loved the German classics, especially Heinrich Heine. Um, he was a liberal who found religious observance outdated, although his wife still observed some Jewish rituals. Needless to say, the grandfather read the Viennese liberal newspaper, Die Presse, which later became the famous Neue Freie Presse, and he uh, read avidly by Herman. The newspaper was also avidly read by Herman's father, a liquor distiller. For 50 years, Herman recalled, this newspaper influenced the political views of his family. Significantly, although the Herman family resided in, in an area densely populated by German speakers, and they did use German as their, as their you know, language, they also spoke Czech, not only with the servants, but also with each other. Although not with his mother, who came from Iglau, Yilava, and did not know Czech. Many members of the extended family had been born in small towns in nearby Bohemia, and they knew Czech well. Moreover, Hermann's grandfather believed in the equality of both languages in the Bohemian lands, a belief that Hermann as ascribed to his 1848 liberalism. Hermann himself knew Czech from his childhood, practiced it when he visited relatives in Bohemia, even if he felt a bit uncomfortable in the entirely Czech language environment of his relatives in, in Potsdam. And he, employed the, and, he, and he employed the opportunity to speak Czech as an adult. He was sympathetic to the Czech national cause. His education, however, like his father before him, was entirely in German language schools. He was actually quite miserable because he found you know, the German nationalist environment of Northern Moravia uncomfortable, which of course, Brees didn't experience in the South. Despite the obvious differences, the experiences of Ignaz Brees and Hugo Hermann reveal the extent to which Moravian Jews had mastered German language and embraced German culture by the middle of the 19th century. Indeed, memoirs of Jews from Moravia, no matter what their religious or political affiliation, all take for granted that Jews in the province primarily spoke German and belonged to the German cultural community, even if they also were Czech. To be sure, they often regarded German as superior to Czech. Antoinette Kaller, for example, who grew up in Brünn, Brno, uh, in the 1860s, the daughter of a wealthy wool factory owner, received a thorough German and minimal Jewish education from tutors at home. When she visited her sister, who married a clothing manufacturer in Prosnitz, Prostiejo, Kaller was appalled by the wet, muddy streets and the, quote, dirty, hostile, foreign language atmosphere, unquote, of this largely Czech-speaking city. 
in which Czech workers, you noted, combined anti-capitalist sentiment with nationalist resentment. Kahler adored Vienna, which he visited often, not only because it was a German speaking city, but because it was a great place to order dresses, to go to the opera and balls, to catch a glimpse of the emperor and empress and to have fun. You see that in a lot of memoirs, by the way, Vienna, what, they didn't love Vienna because it was German, they loved Vienna because you could get good clothes there. Um, after her marriage to a Jewish man from Prague, she moved to the Bohemian capital. But she found Prague, quote, one of the most unhealthy and unhygienic cities of the modern age, unquote, and beset with nationalist conflict. Clearly, she felt distant from the Czech language, the Czech national movement, and from largely Czech-speaking Prague. Similarly, Max Zweig, who was born in Prosnitz, Prostyayo, in 1892, noted in his memoirs that the Jews there, quote, without exception, spoke German, unquote. He attributed the social separation between in the German and Czech speakers in his hometown, as well as the anti-Semitism of many Czech speaking workers in Jewish owned factories to economic resentments, not national ones. As a child, he had learned Czech from his nanny. Although he was not hostile to Czech like Kahler, he did consider German superior to it. Thus he considered Prosnitz Prosyev to be an unattractive spot. Unquote. While Olmutz Olmutz, which it was a German majority city, Olmutz Olmutz, where he attended gymnasium, was, quote, bright and lively, unquote, filled with beautiful buildings and exciting German culture, especially theater, his passion. He too loved Vienna, where he went to university, largely because of its theaters, libraries, and exhibits, as well as its beautiful natural setting. When he arrived there in 1910, he remembered he was in a, quote, frenzy. Unquote. Joseph Wexberg, on the other hand, who was born in 1907 in Marish Ostra, Moravska Ostrava, which is in the east. I can't see it here, it's, but it's some foot. Oh, I, I, the reason I can't see it is because the pictures of people in the Zoom call are there, but it's in the east. Um, uh, the son of a local banker felt no such distance or sense of superiority. Children from Czech, German, and Polish speaking homes played together harboring no sense of national difference in the streets of this coal mining and steel manufacturing city, the Moravian Pittsburgh, he called it. Later, despite his fluency in Czech, Vexburg attended German schools and his family frequented the German theater and read, of course, the Neue Freie Presse. They felt as if the Viennese Jewish writer, Arthur Schnitzler, was a sort of distant relative. And they often visited Vienna where they, like many Moravian Jews, had relatives. Indeed, for his mother visiting her aunt Bertha, Tante Bertha in Vienna, where she could order dresses and go to balls, quote, helped her to bear the realities of life in a provincial town. Unquote. Other memorists also indicate that Jews spoke German but got along with the Czechs. Norbert Troller, born in 1900 in, in uh, Brun, Bruno, the son of a hat manufacturer, noted in his memoirs that, his, that in his city, Quote, most Jews spoke both provincial languages, but, but preferred German. Um, and um, I'm going to skip, I, I mean, just looked at the time, and I think I'm going to skip the rest of, uh, of Troller. Um, but I will read to you about yet another memoirist, my last, I think, Friedrich Bill, who was born in Prosnitz Prostyov in, in the 1890s, 90s, but spent his youth in Brno, likewise criticized German domination of the city. He too recalled that, quote, the thousands of Jews belonged, with few exceptions, to the German cultural community, which they supported with great financial sacrifice and filled with zeal. These memoirs reveal a complex linguistic reality and set of loyalties. Most of these memoirs reveal declining Jewish religious observance over the generations, but strong Jewish identification. All of these Jews insisted that they formed part of the German cultural world, but they did not say they were Germans. They associated German affinities with Habsburg loyalties and with political liberalism. The city they loved to visit was Vienna, not Prague, but they loved Vienna as a German, not as a German city or even as the center of German culture. To them, Vienna was the seat of the Habsburg monarchy, the home of the beloved Emperor Franz Josef, it was also a cosmopolitan center of culture and entertainment, or perhaps most important, a great place to buy clothes. Most of them spoke Czech easily, 
and they harbored no anti-Czech animosity, but German was the language in which they felt most comfortable, in which they had been educated, and which they loved, either as a symbol of modernization, or because it was a Weltsprache, a world language, or simply because it was their language. These Jews lived in a province with a complex linguistic reality. People spoke Czech or German, or Czech, I'm sorry, they spoke Czech or German, or Czech and German, or a variety of local dialects, including those which combine German and Czech, and in the case of Marish Ostro, Moravska Ostrova, also Polish. The Austrian authorities, however, reduced this linguistic complexity by making everyone choose an Umgangssprache, a language of daily speech on the census, beginning in 1880. The authorities wanted to know the language of its citizens in order to provide schools and other services in their languages. But the nationalist activists used the language statistics to measure the strength of the nations they were trying to create. And they agitated vigorously to get people to indicate the right language on the census. The activists assumed that speaking a particular language made people into members of that nation. Thus, German speakers were Germans and Czech speakers were Czech, as far as the nationalists were concerned. Despite what the nationalist activists thought, however, claiming an Umgangssprache, or language of daily speech, on the census did not necessarily reflect national affiliation at all. There were many residents of Habsburg Austria who had no sense that they belonged to any particular nation, no matter what language they spoke. In fact, what historians have now labeled national indifference was widespread especially among peasants and workers. Moreover, many people of all social classes spoke more than one language, but they had to choose for the census. They sometimes felt pressured by the nationalist activists, but also by their employers, their relatives, their neighbors, to indicate a particular language. Thus, these statistics are not a transparent window into actual languages. But despite the problems, they're the only thing we have. The Umgangssprache statistics are our only available measure of language proficiency in the late Habsburg monarchy. Even if the statistics do not tell us whether speakers of a particular language actually felt that they belonged to that nation, they do provide a general sense of the primary language of the inhabitants of Habsburg Austria in this period. In the case of the Jews, the Umgangssprache statistics also shed important light on the political posture of the Jews in relation to the nationalist conflict uh, um, about language. So in 1880, there were 44,000 Jews um, in Moravia. And that year, the census didn't cross tabulate religion and language. So we have no idea how the Jews um, you know, indicated their language. But in Moravia as a whole, 29% um, of the population uh, indicated German and 70% indicated Czech. In the following decades, the percentage of the total population of the province which indicated German or Czech remained virtually the same. The nationalist activists counted every tenth of a point as a major advance or decrease, but for our purposes, it remained more or less the same. But when the census started to cross tabulate religion and, and, and nationality and um, language, we do know, uh, for example, in 1900, um, that 77.4% of the Jews of Moravia indicated German language, and only 15.3%, 15% indicated Czech. If one subtracts those who were not Austrian citizens, then 83% of the Jews of Moravia um, indicated German as their language of daily speech. And this remained unchanged uh, in the 1910 census. Um, in any case, in contrast to Bohemia, Moravian Jews felt no need to publicly disavow their German language loyalties in the decades before the First World War. The contrast with the situation in Bohemia, and I'm actually going to go back so you can see Bohemia, is instructive. Their two Jews were often bilingual, especially but not only in the small towns of the uh, Bohemian countryside. There too, a network of German Jewish schools created in the wake of Joseph II's Edict of Toleration meant that by the middle of the 19th century, uh, most Jews used German as their primary language. As in Moravia, Jewish institutions in Bohemia functioned in German. In the 1890 Austrian census, two thirds of Bohemian Jews and three quarters of the Jews of Prague indicated that their language of daily speech was German. That percentage was slightly lower than Moravia, largely because many Jews in Bohemia lived in villages 
and spoke Czech most of the time. In 1900, however, Bohemian Jews abruptly changed course, at least for the purposes of the census. In that year, the majority of Bohemian Jews, 54%, indicated on the census that Czech was their language of daily speech. Obviously, people do not change their primary language in 10 years. So historians have long debated why Jews in Bohemia opted for Czech in the early 20th century. Hillel Kival, one of these historians, in his important study of Bohemian Jews has argued that the transformation was the natural result of the migration of many village and small town Czech speaking Jews to the cities of Bohemia and, and to Prague, where they became a force for increased Czechification. Moreover, Kival argues the Czech Jewish movement that emerged, Czech Jewish movement, which emerged in the late 19th century, uh, succeeded in its efforts to urge Jews to adopt Czech language and to use it in Jewish institutions to abandon their former German loyalties uh, and to support the Czech national movement and adopt the Czech national identity. To be sure, Jews also reacted, he notes, to the hostility of the Czech national movement against Jews as Germanizers, but he insists the public declaration of Czech language preference was sincere. Other historians have argued that the abrupt about face of Bohemian Jews um, was an opportunist, I'm sorry, was an opportunistic but politically wise, if not successful, move to reduce Czech nationalist animosity against the Jews for speaking German and supposedly supporting German hegemony in Bohemia. Gary Cohn, for example, in his masterful study of Prague Germans has argued that the Jewish switch to Czech language in 1900, uh, to Czech Umgangssprache, language of daily speech in 1900, was a response to Czech nationalist attacks on Jews as Germanizers and also to the anti-Semitic violence, which accompanied the withdrawal of, of the Badeni language ordinances in 1899. I'm not gonna go into detail about that. Um, and to the Czech boycott of German and Jewish owned businesses. The switch to Czech he reveals was most noticeable among poor and lower middle-class Jews, especially shopkeepers who, who most directly felt the effects of that violence and the boycott. So in Bohemia then in 1900, there were, um, wait, uh, no, I'm not going to, never mind. There were more Jews in Bohemia than in Moravia. There were about 93,000 Jews in Bohemia. Um, now, to be sure, the public declaration of Czech language, did, like Czech language use, did not mean that Jews stopped sending their children to German schools or using German in Jewish institutions or even speaking German most of the time. In Prague, for example, 97% of Jewish children, 97%. Um, attended German elementary schools in 1890, 91% in 1900, and 89% in 1910. And virtually all Jews who attended secondary schools attended German institutions. Uh, the question is, why did Moravian Jews not behave like Bohemian Jews? Right? Why did Moravian Jews stick with their German affiliation? They certainly faced similar pressures, including Czech nationalist animosity to Jews as Germanizers and anti-Jewish boycotts and violence especially in 1897 and 1899, and then later after World War I. Yet despite these pressures, Jews in Moravia did not use the census to make a public statement of loyalty to the Czech cause. They continued to use German as their language of daily, to list German as their Umgangssprache, even though the nationalist activists used the census to measure national loyalty. And Czech nationalists denounced the Jews for their language choice. The answer to this question lies in the settlement patterns of Moravian Jews, which stands in stark contrast to the pattern in Bohemia. In Bohemia, about a quarter of the Jews lived in Prague, which was an overwhelmingly Czech speaking city with a significant but declining German minority. In 1880, German speakers formed 15% of the population of Prague, but by the turn of the century, only about 7% of Prague in general, of Prague inhabitants, you listed German as their language of daily speech. By the way, 50, 50 percentage of that, of that 7% were Jews. Um, although in Bohemia, although some Jews lived in cities and towns in the densely German speaking regions of the Northern, Western and Southern border regions of the province, most Jews were scattered in Bohemia. Most Jews were scattered in the small, towns of the Czech speaking regions of the province. And they lived in tiny Jewish communities scattered in Czech speaking small towns. 
uh, and villages. Living in small Jewish settlements in the Czech-speaking countryside, as well as in Prague, Jews keenly felt Czech nationalist pressure, as well as the pressure of the Czech, Germ Czech Jewish movement to adopt a Czech identification. But the Jewish settlement pattern was different in Moravia. Very few Jews lived in the northern part of the province, which was overwhelmingly German speaking. Instead, Jews lived either in cities, which had German speaking majorities, cities like Brunn, Brno, and Iglau Ilava, which is someplace, yes, here it is, Iglau Ilava, or, or in uh, um, um, Olmots, which is sort of here. And uh, uh, so they lived in these German speaking cities, these German majority cities, um, or they lived in reasonably large and densely concentrated Jewish communities in the medium sized market towns of the Czech-speaking south and central part of the province. Indeed, indeed, it is these Czech-speaking market towns which hold the key to Moravian Jewish identity. These were the 52 towns in, to which Jews had been relegated in the 18th century. At that time, Jews were not permitted to live in the royal cities or in the, you know, the larger towns, but they could live in these closed off sections of these 52 market towns in central and southern Bohemia and uh, Moravia. These Jewish quarters were juridically independent from the towns in which they were located. After the revolution of 1848, Jews could leave them and move any place. At that time, the authorities wanted to eliminate the Jewish towns in, and incorporate them into the towns in which they were located. But the larger towns objected. And as a result, unlike in Bohemia, where the Prague Jewish town, for example, became part of the city of Prague, in Moravia, the Habsburg authorities transformed 27 of the former Jewish towns, those deemed large enough to be juridically, to be politically viable. Um, they made them into special communes, special juridically independent towns called political Jewish communities. The Politische Israelitengemeinde, political Jewish communities. These political Jewish communities were juridically independent municipalities, which like all Austrian communes, all Austrian towns, had an elected city government which provided municipal service like garbage collection and police and fire uh, protection, as well as a local school. At first, they also tended to the religious needs of their Jewish residents, but provisionally after 1876 and legally after 1890, they no longer did so. Instead, local Jewish religious communities, Israelitische Kultusgemeinden, usually controlled by exactly the same men, um, administered the synagogue and cemetery and arranged for kosher meat and matzah and other Jewish religious needs. Jews did not have to live in the political Jewish communities and many Jews moved out, either to the larger towns in which they were located or to the cities of Moravia or to Vienna. And poor non-Jews moved in, um, into these towns. But the 27 political Jewish communities became symbols both to the Jews and to their non-Jewish neighbors, that Jews formed a separate German-speaking group in Moravia. Although the Jewish populations declined as Jews sought economic opportunity elsewhere, the political Jewish communities remained places with high concentrations of Jews and Jews controlled their municipal councils, which functioned entirely in German. After 1869, these political Jewish communities also administered public elementary schools, which were ipso facto German Jewish schools. Not only did they offer stand, the standard curriculum of all German language elementary schools in Austria, but they also provided non-mandatory courses in Hebrew, Bible, and Jewish prayer, which were taken by all of the students. Indeed, non-Jewish residents of the political Jewish communities transferred to schools in the larger towns in which these communities were located, and many, not all, but many of the Jews from the towns transferred in so that these German language public schools functioned as local Jewish schools. Eligible voters in the political Jewish communities voted in the urban curia in elections to the Moravian Diet and the Austrian parliament, almost always for the German liberal parties. Such behavior angered the Czech nationalists who insisted that the Jewish political communities tipped the scales in favor of the German parties at local elections. If they had been included in the Czech-speaking towns in which they were located, Czech nationalists argued, 
Jewish votes would have mattered less, diluted by the Czech speakers in the rural curia in which many of these towns voted. While there were too few Jews in these communities to affect political outcomes, the fact that the Czech nationalists assumed Jewish power made the German parties court Jewish support and include Jews in the German political world. The political Jewish communities were Jewish spaces, a fact recognized by the Austrian bureaucrats whose correspondence with them refer to the larger towns in which they were located as the Christian Gemeinde, the Christian community, uh, even though Jews lived in both, right? Um, moreover, the political Jewish communities were places where Jews spoke German in a largely Jewish context in the Czech-speaking part of the province, in the Czech-speaking South and Central part of the province. These communities laid the foundation for the position of the Jews in the Moravian German world and they served as tangible reminders that the Jews formed a separate German Jewish group. So the Jewish population of these Jewish political communities may have been shrinking, but they remained locations of significant Jewish density. And I could give you the actual density, but I'm not going to you know, bore you with statistics in an oral presentation that gets very boring, but rest assured, some of these places were half Jewish, two thirds Jewish, three quarters Jewish, and so forth. Um, uh, and um, you know, these these were all small places. These these um, political Jewish communities were small, but so were the towns in which they were located. Um, and um, and it means that in these towns, the existence of a political Jewish community with its dense concentration of German-speaking Jews was quite noticeable. And again, I could give you good examples, but I think I will only give you one. Um, the town of Bosco, Boscovitz, Boscovica in 1900, the, the town, the larger town, contained about 5,000 people and the com political Jewish community only contained 1,000 people. There were 252 Jews in Boscovitz, Boscovica proper, which is tiny, but the existence of the political Jewish community in which Jews formed 59% uh, of the population, even though it's not a huge number, it reminded everyone of the German Jewish presence. And we could go on with many or other examples. What is more significant than the numbers is that the Jews who moved out of the Politische Israel Lippengemeinden, the political Jewish communities, into the larger towns in which they were located, remained in close contact with the Jews who remained in these Jewish spaces. Indeed, in all cases, they formed one religious Jewish community, attending synagogue together, if they still went to synagogue, and in many cases, also the German Jewish school run by the political Jewish community. Because of that close contact, their move did not mean that they ceased speaking German, even in towns that were overwhelmingly Czech speaking. Prosnitz Prosyov is a case in point. It was a largely Czech speaking industrial city, a center of cotton textile production and clothing manufacturing with many of its factories owned by Jewish merchants. In the 1900 census, 95% of the residents indicated Czech language of daily speech. Um, yet the Jewish religious community of Proznitz, Prosyov, which administered the religious needs of most Jews in the town and in the political Jewish community functioned in German. Unlike in Bohemia, the German language milieu of the political Jewish communities thus made it easier for Jews who, mo who moved into the Czech speaking towns in which they were located to continue to function largely in German, which was the language of the Jewish community, of the Jewish religious community. Um, okay, so let's move on. Um, I, I could go on with endless numbers of statistics, but, in the, but I'm not going to bore you with them. Uh, no matter where they live, Moravian Jews recognized the significance of the political Jewish communities and Jewish life in the province. We have seen how uh, Ignaz Brietz rom Brietz rom uh, romanticized the intense Jewish atmosphere of the Prerau Sherov of his youth. Hugo Hermann, who I quoted earlier, who grew up in the North, regarded Jews who lived in the political Jewish communities as the real Moravian Jews. In his memoirs, Hermann noted that the Jews who grew up in the Kahilas, he actually used the Ashkenazi Hebrew slash Yiddish word for Jewish community, who grew up in the, he called the political Jewish communities the Kahila, the Jewish 
community and used a Jewish term. Um, uh, of Southern and Central Moravia were, and I quote, enthusiastically, even aggressively devoted to announcing their Jewishness, unquote. Like the Jews in Bohemia, they lived in a Czech-speaking environment, but unlike many Bohemian Jews, they did not adopt the Czech identity. On the contrary, Herman insisted, they had their own sense of Jewish, as their distinctiveness as Jews. Of course, not all the Jews lived in the political Jewish communities. A lot of Jews lived in the German-speaking cities of the province, in Brun, Brno, Iglau Yilava, Olmutz, uh, Olomotz, Snai and Snoimo, and the new city, Marish, Ostro, Ostrova, Moravska. Uh, most of these cities had German-speaking majorities. Um, Ostrova actually just had a German-speaking plurality, not majority. But, um, but the Jews there in the second half of the 19th century in all of those cities, joined a largely German-speaking world. There were two smaller cities which were Czech-speaking, and the Jews didn't move there. They moved to the German-speaking cities. Um, and of course, there they were part of a larger German-speaking world. Um, and it's not surprising that you know they would speak German in those cities. OK. Um, as a result of these settlement patterns, most Jews in Moravia lived in a German-speaking environment, either one inhabited almost entirely by Jews, as in the political Jewish communities and their associated towns, or as part of a larger German milieu in the German-speaking cities of the province. Unlike in nearby Bohemia, therefore, Moravian Jews could easily remain part of the German world in the late Habsburg period, even if they also formed a separate group within it. And this German world remained open to the Jews, at least in central and southern Moravia. Um, so that's Moravia and Jews were very involved. I, 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 I've spent a lot of time on the settlement pattern because I think it formed the basis of this allegiance, but Jews of course joined, joined Jewish uh, German organizations and participated uh, in the German world in the province. And I'm not going to go into detail about that, but I can certainly answer any questions you may have about it during the question and answer period. And what's interesting is that the German world in central and southern Moravia remained relatively immune from the anti-Semitism that swept other German communities in the Bohemian borderlands and in northern Moravia. Um, uh, sort of radical German nationalism and its attendant anti-Semitism was not especially uh, popular in Central and Southern Moravia, where Jews were comfortable in the German world. Um, and sometimes, of course, the membership in the German world was fraught. I'm not, I'm not trying to over-romanticize it. It wasn't a perfect, um, a perfect relationship, but, um, but it was a very important um, uh, relationship. Okay, I would like to, I know I, I, I took a look at the time and I got nervous that I'm really almost out of time. I always speak longer than I should and I apologize. Um, but um, let me just conclude, not the whole talk, but this part about Habsburg Moravia to say that if you look at a lot of the memoirs, in particular Joseph Wexford, you really get the sense that most Jews in, in, in Moravia had a sense of, of themselves as a separate group within the German, within the German world. Okay, so what about Czechoslovakia? I will speak very briefly about Czechoslovakia. And again, you can ask me more about it. Uh, Jews like Czechoslovakia. They thought of it as a new and improved version of, of the Habsburg monarchy, more democratic and so forth. Uh, they liked it a lot. Um, and Czechoslovakia, uh, as many of you may know, had a very complex and complicated nationalities uh, um, political issue. Um, there were many different nationalities within Czechoslovakia. There were the Czechoslovaks who were a fictively combined Czechs and Slovaks group, so there could be a majority. Uh, but there were also Germans and there were Magyars, they were Hungarians. I'm gonna to go to the next map. Yeah, um, there, were there were Magyars, there were Hungarians, there were some Poles. And uh, the, the authorities were mostly Czechs and they were very suspicious of the Germans. Um, and they were very suspicious of the Hungarians and they suspected them of disloyalty to Czechoslovakia. But what about the Jews? Czechoslovakia in 1920 
gave the Jews the right, no matter what language they spoke, to declare a Jewish nationality um, uh, if, if they wanted to. They didn't have to, but they could. Um, generally, nationality was determined in Czechoslovakia on the basis of language, but not for the Jews. The Jews could choose the, the nationality to which they belonged. Um, this was done mostly to reduce the number of Germans and Magyars in Czechoslovakia. But anyway, a lot of Jews in Czechoslovakia asserted Jewish nationality, 54%, the majority, a bare majority, but still the majority of Jews in Czechoslovakia. The percentage was lowest in, in Bohemia, where Jews were more Czechified. Um, there, it was only about 20%, 16% in 1921 and 22% in 1930, but it's about 20% in Bohemia. The country average is 54%. Slovakia was 54%. This area, Subcarpathian Ruthenia, oops, where's my name, was 83%. That's because it was mostly Hasidic Jews who didn't understand the question about nationality. You know, they were Jewish, so they said they were Jewish. Um, but um, in, in Moravia, it was 54%. It was, well, it's about 52%. It was about the national average. Declaring Jewish nationality allowed Jews to declare their loyalty to Czechoslovakia, speak whichever language they chose, and, and still be Jewish, right? It was a good thing. They weren't Germans. They were Jews, right? That was a good thing. They weren't the disloyal Germans. Not that the Germans were as disloyal as the Czechs thought they were, but they, you know, they, they could distance themselves from that, from the German group or the Magyar group in Slovakia, the Hungarian group. Um, so in, in um, the interwar period, the Jews of Moravia, the majority of them, the, approximately the majority, said that they were Jewish by nationality, about a third said they were German, and a tiny group, 16%, said that they were Czechoslovak. And again, this is because of the settlement patterns. Um, and if you take a look at the, what had, Czechoslovakia got rid of the political Jewish communities. They hated them and they got rid of them. But still, there, there, there was still this memory of those political Jewish communities and Jews in what had been the political Jewish communities and the towns associated them, with them were especially likely to insist, uh, to assert, to affirm uh, Jewish nationality on the census. Um, so for example, in Baskowitz, Poskowitza, it was 80% of the Jews there said that they were members of the Jewish nationality. In Prosnitz, it was in Gaia or Kiev, it was 87%. In Prosnitz, Prosnitz, it was only 51%. It was a little lower. Um, Jewish nationality did not mean that these people were Zionists. It just meant that they were Jews, not Germans or, Mag or Hungarians or something else that Czechoslovakia didn't like. And they didn't say they were Czechoslovakians, even though they spoke Czech because they didn't feel that they were Czechoslovak. They felt that they were Jewish, German-speaking Jews. Um, and Jews continued their German language and cultural affiliation. Um, and just one quotation from, Je from a memoir, Joseph uh, Vexberg from Marisz Ostro Ostrova said, linguistically, my hometown was a complex place. The Czech spoke Czech, the Poles spoke Polish, the Germans spoke German, the Jews, right, they're a separate group. The Jews spoke Czech at the tax collector's office or in court and German amongst themselves. It was a fine melting pot in which no one melted. Now, maybe they did, but he said they didn't. Um, at, when the German gymnasium in Brun, Bruno celebrated its 350th anniversary in 1928, the Jewish community held a festive religious service in the synagogue, right? I mean, the, the, the alliance was still quite strong. Uh, Jewish communities conducted their business in German. The minutes of all, all the Jewish religious communities in Moravia were in German until some point in the mid 1930s. Before that, German. Uh, and after that, Czech. They were bilingual. They had no trouble making the switch. And they did it suddenly, almost overnight, in every case. They still gave, rabbis still gave sermons in German. Everything was done in German. Um, the, um, okay. So. Uh, yes, there was a decline in Jewish attendance at the German elementary schools because they were closed. <laughs> but Czechoslovakia closed uh, most of those schools uh, because the Jewish political communities no longer existed. Um, so, you know, and Jews, and, and, and of course, since Jews lived in these Czech speaking market towns, they didn't go to German schools because there were no German schools in those regions. The Jewish school had been the German school. And so, if they still lived in Prosnitz or Vaskowitz, they had to go to a Czech school. Um, they, 
uh, in, of course, in the bigger cities, they could still go to German schools. Okay, so the switch came almost overnight, um, or, or in fact, it did come overnight. Um, in 1935, uh, when the two thirds of the vote for the Sudeten German party, uh, you know, when two thirds of what people assumed was the German vote went to the Sudeten German party, Jews got really scared and, um, and they switched to Czech. And we see this, it, there was a Jewish religious school operated in Marish Ostro, Ostrova, uh, Moravska Ostrova, um, which was in German until 1935. <laughs> it taught Czech, it always taught Czech, these Jewish schools always taught Czech. And in 1928, it did increase the hours of Czech, mostly in unimportant subjects like sewing and, and uh, you know, car woodwork and gymnastics and singing. You know, but the important subjects, reading, writing, arithmetic, Jewish religion, that was all still taught in German. Um, but with the, growth, with the growth of Nazism in Germany, with 1933 coming to power of the Nazis in Germany, and the 1935 election in Czechoslovakia, the school just switched to Czech. Just switched to Czech. Um, and, and Jewish communities all over Czechoslovakia kept their units in Czech. So in Czechoslovakia, Jews had been part of the German world until the rise of Nazism. And because of Nazism, the German world was no longer open to Jews. Not that all Czech Germans became Nazis, they didn't, but Nazism scared the Jews a lot. And um, so they easily switched to Czech. And, and they could do that because they were always bilingual. Um, but German remained a, Jer a Jewish language. Jews continued to speak German with each other. Um, Max Zweig from Prosnitz, um, he had moved to Germany in, um, in the 1920s. He was a playwright and he, he liked Weimar Berlin very well. But in 1934, he returned to Czechoslovakia to Prosnitz and he continued to write and speak in German, happy with the protection of Czechoslovakia, but not part of the Czech world. He did go to Palestine in 1938. He was, and he um, was part of the of the sort of diaspora of German speaking Central Europeans, especially those from Bohemia and Moravia um, in, in Palestine, um, what is now Israel. Um, but he remained, I mean, he never learned Hebrew. German was his language until he died in his 90s, in the 1990s. And so, um, you know, he felt very sad when all of his colleagues died uh, who spoke German because he was sort of alone as a German speaker. In any case, this. Jews were part of the German world in Moravia, but it all came to an end uh, with the Holocaust. Yet the tragic end doesn't mean that belonging to the German world wasn't an important part of the Jewish experience. Um, one that those fortunate enough to leave treasured greatly in their exile in Palestine, in British Mandate Palestine, or in Great Britain itself, or in the United States. Thank you. And I'm sorry I went on a little longer than I should have. Thank you very, thank you very much, Marsha, for a really rich um, paper, which really gets us into thinking about Jews in this in, in this rather rather complex world. And uh, but you you put it across so clearly, and I think it's really really wonderful. Um, we now going to open up for questions, and I might just um, while you're thinking of your questions, you can post them in the chat, or you can raise your hand and. Um, uh, we can hear you. And while we're doing that, I might just, um, we have got one coming in already. I'll throw one at you though, Marsha, if I may. Um, I was, I'm, I'm interested a little bit in the, um, uh, the tensions possible within the various Jewish communities. And you mentioned Zionism just in passing. And I wondered how much Zionism actually entered the Jewish world in Moravia. And um, whether there were other kind of um, uh, tensions among among the Jews about which direction they should go in, essentially. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mark. Yes, um, there were lots of Jews were Zionists. I mean, in the starting in the late nineteenth century and in the in, and throughout the twentieth century, uh, you know, until until the end. Um, Zionism was popular. I just made the point that not all Jews who said they were members of the Jewish nationality were Zionists, right? Not all members of, they just said they were members of the Jewish nation uh, for, 
for all sorts of reasons. But there was, Zionism was probably more popular in, um, in Moravia than in Bohemia. Uh, there were Zionists in Bohemia, of course. In fact, some of the intellectual powerhouses of the interwar period in the Zionist movement were from, um, from Prague. There was a whole Prague Zionist mafia. Um, and, but, um, but, so, but not all Jews were Zionists. You know, many Jews, especially in the bigger cities, were not Zionists. So we'd appeal to them, but not, it wasn't as in, in interwar Poland, Zionism became, you know, um, among the non-Orthodox Jews, Zionism was the, you know, um, not, it wasn't the, everybody, but it was very, very popular. I don't think Zionism was as popular um, um, in, in Moravia as in Poland, but, but Zionism was popular. Tatiana Lichtenstein has written a very fine book about Zionism in interwar Czechoslovakia. Um, and, and she makes many arguments there, but she shows, and, and her focus is mostly Bohemia, but, um, but she does show that Zionism provided Jews with a way of being loyal citizens of this state, speaking, you know, whatever language, mostly German, um, but some Jews did speak Czech and, and so forth and other languages. I mean, all Jews were bilingual. Franz Kafka was bilingual. He spoke Czech, uh, you know, but he wrote in German, right? Um, so um, the, uh, it, so they, they, they uh, it provided them with a way of speaking whatever language and, you know, asserting that they were members of the Jewish nation. So, um, so Zionism was quite popular, but not, but it wasn't everybody. I want to respond. Can I respond to this first comment that I see about somebody whose family was from Portlitz? Peter Barber wrote that his great grandfather was from Portlitz, which was one of those um, political Jewish communities. His father was the director um, of the German of Jewish school and the secretary of the German theater in, in Brno in Brun. Um, he felt culturally German and loyal to Czechoslovakia, no conflict until 34, 35. My God, this man proves everything I've just said. Um, uh, he continued to champion liberal German culture till 1939. The family spoke German. Um, somebody never learned Czech. Uh, exactly. Yes, I mean, I mean, a lot of Jews did know Czech, but, um, but uh, that's, that's not atypical. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's great. Okay. So we've got a few, um, anyway, well, let's go to Louise Hecht. I've kept you waiting a long time. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Marsha, for a very rich talk. Uh, a pleasure to hear you as always. Uh, I just wanted to add to your uh, answer to, um, to Mark, a pity that Dieter, my husband, couldn't log on. Probably he, he had issues with the, with the link as well, because actually, um, Part of his work is on Zionism of Moravian, of Moravian Jews. And one of his arguments is that um, Moravian Jews were especially drawn to the revisionist um, oh. uh, parties uh, in, in the Zionist movements, uh, like also many Austrian uh, Jews. Um, yeah, but actually, that was not my question. <laughs> uh, no, but I'll, I'll mark it down and I'll answer Dieter's <laughs> question too. <laughs> Right. Um, I, I especially liked your framing of uh, the uniqueness of Moravian Judaism, uh, of, of Moravian Jews through the language perspective. Um, but I do see some kind of ambivalence here. And, my, and, and this goes to the pre-World War I uh, experience, obviously, because I don't work in Czechoslovakia. Uh, you said, and I completely agree, uh, or I mostly agree to this, that um, the allegiance that the speaking German also expressed uh, the allegiance of the, these Jews to liberalism. So, on the other hand, and I also, I, I was actually very happy uh, that you focused so extensively on the uh, political Jewish communities in Moravia, which are really exceptional, not only for the period, but um, in general in the, in the Jewish world. Um, this, these uh, political Jewish communities in some way contradict liberalism uh, in, their, in their national allegiance um, to to Judaism. 
Uh, and um, and another an, another remark, which somehow goes with uh, Peter Barber's um, um, about his family. Um, the, I I think you're a little bit too optimistic about bilingualism. Of <laughs> Moravian Jews, a lot of a lot of Moravian Jews did either not know Czech not know Czech well and clearly considered it as an inferior language, as for instance, Egon Zweig, the cousin of Max Zweig and Stefan Zweig, uh, whom you quoted, um, he, he uh, has some very derogative commentaries about, about mm -hmm. Czech language, and I think he's not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and that's why I cited Collar, because I wanted to at least give one negative voice. She was negative. <laughs> okay, <laughs> got it. Well, that, thank you very much, Louisa. The, the um, yeah, the, it, well, there's so much I could, could address. Um, I think, obviously, you know, when you say somebody is bilingual, what does that mean? Right? Bilingualism is a complex issue. And was it just functional bilingualism, right? They could certainly, you know, sell things in a store and buy things in a store. Could they have a sophisticated conversation in Czech? You know, I don't know. Um, I, they, a lot of them say they know Czech and many of them clearly did function in Czech. Uh, Joseph Vexberg certainly knew Czech well, at least to talk. I mean, I don't know if he felt comfortable reading philosophy in Czech, but he, but he certainly could, could speak Czech. Um, you know, and it's hard to say, and people are all different, you know, and how much they, they speak uh, varies. Um, uh, I thought it was interesting when I was doing my research that the German Jewish schools all taught Czech, right? Not all German schools in Bohemia and Moravia taught Czech, um, or they taught a bare minimum of Czech. Now, did kids take it seriously? You know, there's learning a language and learning a language. We know from communist Poland or communist um, any place, <laughs> you know, that the, I mean, I remember when I went to communist Hungary in 1977, uh, Georgie Ronke's daughter who took me around, I don't know why his Ronke said, my daughter will show you Budapest or something. But anyway, um, she said to me that they all learned Russian from first grade to 12th grade. None of them knew Russian. They learned English just from ninth grade to 12th grade and they all knew English, right? Now, what does that mean? Did they really not know Russian? You know, they probably knew Russian, but not as well. They were opposed to knowing Russian, so they didn't. Anyway, I, I, I don't wanna go into too much about that, but yes, maybe I, I over-exaggerate how well they knew Czech because I don't want people to think they didn't know Czech, right? Um, and, and, and knowledge of Czech was reasonable reasonably widespread. Some people did, right? Hermann says he knew Czech, but his mother didn't, right? And she was from Moravia. She was from Iglau, Ilava. Um, uh, so not everybody knew Czech, or they didn't know it well enough. Um, that's true. That's true. In terms of the Zionists, yeah, a lot of Austrian Zionists were revisionists. I mean, the head of Viennese Zionist was also a revisionist, that's a right-wing, very right-wing Zionist, which is interesting. And the Prague Zionists who weren't Zion revisionists hated Stricker, the Viennese Zionist, because he was a revisionist. So, you know, there was complication. And, and, and um, Egon Zweig, who Dieter is studying, at, at, you know, and or has written about, he certainly was a revisionist, um, right. And I, you know, he didn't, I, I mean, I don't know how good his check was, I, I don't know. But, um, but in any case, I don't have a real explanation for why the, more of the Zionists were revisionists. It's true that a lot of them were but I don't know why. I haven't, I haven't studied it head on. Maybe Dieter has a better explanation for, for the why. It's true that being a Zionist or being a political Jewish community is not liberal, right? The liberals, you know, it, it wasn't a liberal thing to do to keep these Jewish political communities. They did it, I think, because the towns just really didn't want to have these Jews in them. I don't, I don't really know. I mean, Michael Miller has, I, he's my source for that period. I, I haven't studied it myself. So um, it's, it's all quite interesting. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll press on with some other questions if we may. Um, Mary, Mary Hyman from Cardiff um, has a question, I think. Hi. Mary. Uh, hi, um, I really enjoyed your talk, by the way. It was so clear, um, wonderful. And I was just wondering about the role of, of Tege Masaryk in, in this, because of course he's associated in, in you know, the castle 
propaganda and so on with anti-Semitism. On the other hand, he himself said that he was anti-Semitic in his you know, conversations with Chuck. And I was wondering how the Jewish community dealt with someone like that who was politically opposed to anti-Semitism, but might be anti-Semitic themselves and who was maybe using Zionism as, as the only possible way of being Jewish. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts or comments. Yeah, I do. It's a great question. Thank you. And it's nice to meet you, even if it's yes, only well, virtually. Well, yes, I've read yes. your book. I know you're, you know, of course I've read the music too. I really, you know, um, the, um, they loved him. You know, they loved Masaryk. Mm. They loved the fact that he opposed uh, um, uh, anti-Semitism. They loved the fact that he supported Zionism, you know. And they were the Zionists were were annoyed at him for uh, for his anti-Semitism. Max Brod, for example, was not thrilled, you know. And he wrote it very, you know, his Schleifersleben, you know, um, whatever, however you translate that, um, uh, was uh, you know he talks it at great length um, mm. uh, about about it. But they they were really happy. The Zionists were certainly joyful that he recognized the Jews as a nation, so they just don't believe. I mean, the way he was anti-Semitic was that he didn't think the Jews could be Czech. He had a kind of more um, essentialist view of what it meant to be Czech, and the Jews were not Czech, even if they spoke Czech, you know, they were in Czech. Um, uh, and so he liked it when the Jews were Zionists. He liked Zionist Jews. Exactly, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, so that was good. Um, other Jews just ignored it. I mean, they just were so happy that he was publicly opposed to anti-Semitism, that he recognized Jewish nationality, that he recognized Zionism, mm -hmm. that, um, and there are many, as you may know, in, in Israel, many uh, kibbutzim that were formed in the 1920s and 30s by, by Jews from Czechoslovakia, you know, are you know, named after something having to do with Masaryk, right? There's, well, it's not a kibbutz, it's just a town, but Kfar Masaryk and uh, and there's Kibbutz Sarid, which is I don't know what its connection actually is to Masaryk, but it was of Czech, it was of uh, Jews from Czechoslovakia, and they're 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 all and there's of course a Masaryk street and lots of and lots of cities and towns in in Israel, um, and uh, and so forth. So yeah, he was popular even if he, you know, listen, you know, there's uh, there's anti-Semitism and there's anti-Semitism. His yes. wasn't so bad, <laughs> right. Thank you so much. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Um, this might have to be the last question, I think, from Peter Barber, who um, you, um, you've already set, put something in the chat for us, so um, you might want to follow that up, perhaps. Yeah, well, I simply wanted to say, a point of correct of observation, that my father went to school with Pepe Vexberg, and his first language, Pepe's first language <clears throat> was, was German. Um, but I think the whole language question is due to generation. Um, people who were born before 1918 learnt Czech, le sorry, learnt German. People who were, who were born after 1918 had to go to Czech schools. And in my family, certainly, you can see the change from German to Czech in those terms. So mm -hmm. I think, it, you know, this whole thing is less intellectual than to do with politics and, um, and generation. Well, yes, but it's a little more complicated because it depended where. You had to go to Czech schools if you lived in a small town in the south and central part of the, of the province. But if you were in Brun Brno, you didn't have to go to a Czech school. You could go to a German school. There were German schools still. Yeah, but my, all my, my, my mother actually, my family actually came from Brno. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. So I, some I can, Jews I may have chosen. That, that right. they had to, my mother and her sister had to learn uh, Czech in school. But of for course, my mother, for my mother, it rem German remained the predominant language, but my aunt, being that much younger, transferred in 1938 to a Czech-speaking Jewish school. Yes, because and the so, Jewish school had had uh, had switched to Czech. Yes. So her her first. But it was a Zionist Czech. school. Yeah. <laughs> right. It, it's all very complicated, as you point out. It it really is. Um, it is generationally related, but it's not only generational. And 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 Vex, Pepe Vexberg, as you call him, Pepe being the German nickname for Joseph, um, Pepe Vexberg um, was born before World War One. You know, he was born in 1907. He started school before the war, um, and so and he went to the German Jewish school in 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 um, in Marish, Ostro, Ostrova Morovska. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and then he went to the German gymnasium, and then he went to the German branch of the 
Charles University in Prague. And, uh, but he spoke Czech and his yeah. wife was Czech. I think he, yeah. he married, um, I think his wife but was if I have to say, If I have to say one thing, my father, who went to school with, with him, learned Czech, but he remembered being discriminated against when he was a student in, in, in Brno in the 1920s by the Czech yeah. students. Right, it depends which school, that's right. I, there is another thing in the chat that I just want to answer. Um, no, I don't uh, think Very I quickly, Marsha, because we need to... Oh, oh, oh okay, to okay never mind, then I won't, then I won't, then I won't. Okay, fine, thank you. No, thank you very much. I'm afraid we, we have to bring it to a close, um, but um, thank you so much, Marsha. And the, I think what this has really shown is, I mean, you, you, your work is based on a really rich um, group of memoirs and threw us into a world which is really absolutely fascinating in the diversity of the Jewish experience. And then we've also had even some personal memoirs um, of how this played out in, 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 well not, I suppose, living memory actually. So that's really, really fascinating as well. So thank you so much. And um, yes, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, I, I think we could have gone on for another two hours, but I'm afraid <laughs> here, in, here, in, here in Britain, it's kind of getting towards dinner time. So, <laughs> and I think probably, you know, you've been speaking for one and a half hours really. So I think we should give you a rest too. Yes, well, but thank you all. You've been wonderful. And thank you all for coming and asking great questions and putting me on the spot about my optimism. <laughs> thank you. Um, Claire, do you want to say something? I think yeah, Claire probably just has, to has say, a few words. It, it was brilliant. Thank you for all this passion, enthusiasm. And uh, yeah, you made it really lively and engaging. So many thanks. Sorry about, I know that there were uh, problems with the link. Uh, this lecture has been recorded, so it will be uh, published on our YouTube channel. And I posted information to our next uh, research seminar. So you are all welcome to join in and to register. Have all a wonderful well, day, rest of your day or evening. Bye bye. Thank you.